I waited 21 years and every year I knitted him a jumper. From the age of one to 21, and I kept them all. So when he eventually turned up, if he was alive, he would know that I loved him and I cared for him. A window into one woman's lifetime of crushing pain after having her child taken at birth. She's just one of many tens of thousands. Welcome to Four Corners. After the sensational events that have paralysed the government in the past week and the fallout from today's Labor leadership vote, a Senate committee report into forced adoption policies due for release on Wednesday may slip under the media's radar. But the report will be packed with stories demanding to be heard. For something like half a century until the mid-70s, it was common practice in Australia for the babies of unwed mothers to be adopted in secrecy. They were called closed adoptions based on the principle of a so-called clean break between mother and child, with the child's original birth certificate to be sealed forever. Many of those mothers maintain to this day they were compelled to give up their child. Some did not see, let alone hold their child. Until the 60s, no national figures were kept on closed adoptions. But at the peak of the practice, there were nearly 10,000 in just one year. Advocacy groups estimate up to 250,000 women gave up a baby for adoption. Many more lives were deeply affected. For this report, some of those women tell their stories to reporter Jeff Thompson. Good girl. Oh. Good girl. And again, that's a good girl. Good girl. Good girl. Okay, and again. Oh, darling. Good girl. Just, oh, just oh, hold baby. the baby. Oh, hold the baby. Oh, the baby. Oh, 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 baby when a new human life arrives in our complex world. After nine months bonded as one, an unmarried mum and her baby endure the bittersweet moment of their first separation. Only to begin the closest coupling most women will ever know. Jessica Lachlan and her partner Nathan Sheens wanted to capture the first time they saw their son, Harley. When he first came out and was on my chest, it was, uh, it was just beautiful. I, I don't know, just the happiest moment of my life, really. When I finally held him, it was just... Yeah, it's a pretty special it's moment. It's so special yeah. when you look at each other and we just looked at each other like, oh my gosh, we created this little miracle. Oh. Like, it's amazing. So. How would you feel if, at that moment you weren't allowed to see your baby and he was taken straight away. Oh, I, that makes me teary talking about that because I couldn't imagine not... Oh, it's awful. Like, who wouldn't want to see their baby, you know? Decades ago, childbirth was a very different experience for thousands of Australia's unmarried mums. To single mothers, the birth of a baby becomes the moment of truth, when all her natural emotions conflict with pangs of doubt, loneliness, fear, guilt, and the practical problems confronting her. It is from this moment of reality that she must fully face a decision which she may later regret, whether to keep her baby or offer it for adoption. But was their choice truly free? Many now insist they were forced to surrender their children by institutions and individuals protected by an unsympathetic society. Often, the trauma of that loss has never left them. To go through your life and um, never know, to never know what it is like to see the child that you gave birth to, is a terrible thing. I learned a very big life lesson. I learned that I'm unworthy. I am unfit. And so I have never married and I have never given birth to another child. It wasn't like giving birth. It was just like an instant loss. As you know, for months beforehand, feeling moving and kicking, and then he's not there and not in your arms, he's just gone.
50 years ago, the sanctity of marriage was still regarded as a crucial cornerstone of Australian society. It was very far from accepted that children could be raised outside this union blessed by church and state. For young and pregnant single women, it was a harsh and unforgiving land. It had worse than death. I mean, that was, the, that was the common expression. I think for the women who were going through that process, it was, for most of them, pretty terrible. Yeah, very painful, very traumatic. For the unmarried mother in Australia, the price of respectability is isolation. And her pregnancy usually means a flight to the anonymity of life in another city, another state. One girl told me it meant her first separation from home, her first long train journey. Mum just said to me, she came into the bedroom and she said, she said, no, you can't stay here. She said, we'll have to find a home for you to go somewhere. Expectant unwed women were suddenly shunted into a secret world of shame. They were hidden at home. Some were sent overseas. Others were packed off interstate to special homes for unmarried mothers-to-be. One of the busiest was Karama in the northern Sydney suburb of Taramara, an Anglican home run by matron Shirley Jones. Karama's matron Jones explained that the girl can see her baby at least once, but not hold it or feed it. Is she told much about the new parents? Yes. I do like to let the girl know um, if she particularly wants to know, most of them do, the type of work the adopting father would do and uh, the type of suburb, nothing that would identify suburb or person. And the two parties never meet? Never, no. Jan Cashin was sent from Brisbane to Shirley Jones's care in 1963. She was 21, employed as a teacher and engaged to be married to the father of her child. I did tell her, I said, well, um, my fiance has gone back to get Brisbane to get permission for us to marry and I'll be taking my son because I knew I was having a son. I'll be taking my son and um, I'll be getting married and he's not for adoption. And she said to me, oh, you haven't thought this through. And I said, this is my child. I'm now 21. I have every right to take my child. And she said, oh no, the, the welfare will listen to me. And they have in the past. And I thought, oh dear. A fall at Karamar triggered a premature birth at Hornsby Hospital. Jan Cashin is a painter. Her art remains haunted by what happened next. A nurse came and sat down beside me and smiled and I thought, Oh, thank God there's a smiling face. Anyway, she settled herself down beside me and pulled up a chair and proceeded to take uh, a leather shackle from her uniform and she started strapping up my right wrist. And uh, I was puzzled, I didn't know what she was doing. And then she secured me to the side of the bed. So I became unconscious and I don't know how long I was unconscious for but when I eventually came to my son was gone. This series of self-portraits depicts Jan's growing distress as her repeated attempts to see her newborn son were refused. They said what are you doing here? as though I was a criminal, you know, what are you doing here? And I said, I'd like to see my son, thank you. You shouldn't be here. You should go back to your ward. Three weeks after her son was born, 
Jan married his father. They went on to have two daughters, but she never got over losing her first child. You said your son wasn't for adoption, but you were conscious that you were signing adoption papers. They weren't going to let me take my baby home. I wasn't allowed to see him. You don't feel you had a choice? Well, if I ran out of there with my child, the police would have been called. My child would have been retrieved. Uh, he then would have been put in foster care. What do you feel was taken away from you then? <laughs> My life. My life. It was the practice of all hospitals actually dealing with single mothers from about the 1950s to not allow them to see the child. They would argue that it was going to hurt the mothers less if they actually didn't see their children. But of course, again, they didn't ask the mothers. Years from the early 1960s to the early 1970s were boom time for Australia's adoption industry. The sexual revolution was underway, but the stigma of illegitimacy showed few signs of retreat before 1973. That's when supporting mothers' benefits were extended to single women. Before the mid-1960s, regulation of the adoption industry was far from uniform. In 1963, the federal government promoted a Model Adoption Act, which formed the basis of laws introduced around the country. It stated that consent to adoption could only be given by a woman in a fit condition, not signing under duress. Mothers were usually given at least three days after giving birth to sign consent, and then had 30 days to change their minds. The laws were meant to give legal certainty to adoptive parents while protecting the rights of relinquishing mothers. But in practice, many mothers say those rights were denied. I think losing my daughter um, it broke something in me. It really did break something in me that has never been whole since. Monica Jones endured not one, but two adoptions she felt powerless to refuse. Businesses now occupied this corner block in inner city Sydney's Surrey Hills. But in the 1960s, it was Crown Street Women's Hospital, one of the biggest sources of adopted babies in the country. Monica gave birth to a son here in 1966 when she was 21. I woke up in the corridor in the early hours of the morning and I had blood all over me. That was all I remember. <laughs> I don't remember anything else. I don't remember signing any papers. I don't remember, remember people coming to see me or anything like that. When Monica fell pregnant again a year later, she was in a serious relationship which didn't last. At Sydney's Mater Hospital, she gave birth to a daughter she says she was never allowed to see. It was a form of punishment. We were naughty girls and we didn't deserve to have our babies. And that's the way I've lived since I was 22. I have lived with that uh, shame that I was a naughty girl and I had to be punished. So here on your medical records it says UB minus or UB negative. What did you understand that to mean? That means unmarried baby for adoption. But I'd never, I didn't know about that until I got my records, you know. Patient documents from Crown Street and other maternity hospitals show that from the moment most unmarried women arrived, their records were marked. At Crown Street, the favourite acronyms were either UB negative or BFA, baby for adoption. Well, the practice, the general practice was that the baby would be whisked away to the nursery. It would be labelled, you know, BFA, a baby for adoption. Elspeth Brown was a young social worker at Crown Street in the early 1960s. 
So this is you as a young social worker? Social worker, there's my badge from the Institute of Almoners. Social workers, or almoners, as they were then called, counselled pregnant single women about the difficult choice they faced. She's adamant that she never stopped an unmarried mother from seeing her child. But she didn't encourage it either. Most of them would say, I don't have to see my baby, do I? And you'd say, no, you don't have to. But occasionally, uh, a, a woman would say, oh, I really, I don't think I can sign the papers until I've seen my baby. I would not take someone to see a baby who was uncertain as to whether they were going to have their baby adopted or not. Uh, because I felt that that needed, that had to be resolved. That had to be resolved. So in a sense, one might well feel that, and I'm thinking, I'm thinking from the girl's point of view, that might be, oh, well, she will only let me see the baby if I've promised her I'm going to have the baby adopted. See what I mean? Now, she... <laughs> A young woman could, could not be forced to sign those papers, could not be. If we're talking about a woman who is, has, has had a baby in circumstances where adoption has been discussed, um, then as a matter of law, there's simply no basis on which people can stop her from seeing her baby. I think it's clear that um, uh, during that period when she's given birth and she hasn't yet consented to adoption, she should have been treated with exactly the same respect uh, as any other mother and treated with exactly the same decision-making powers as any other mother. Professor Richard Chisholm is a former family court judge. Would it be illegal in that period to prevent her from seeing a baby? Uh, if that wasn't made necessary by some medical consideration and if she hadn't consented to it, yes, it would be. Robin Turner does not recall consenting to anything at Crown Street Hospital after her son was born with an enlarged kidney. It was 1967 and she was 17. I remember the sheet being held up in front of me. Uh, I remember them saying that it was a healthy baby boy. I remember hearing him crying. And after that, I, I woke up in a ward with married women when they brought their babies in for a 6am feed. What happened next? I asked for my child. Her son moved to the children's hospital without her permission. Robin says she refused to agree to his medical treatment or adoption unless she could see him. They asked me, if you won't sign these papers, you know, you don't care about your son, you don't love your son because you can't look after him. How are you going to afford his medical treatment? Are you going to become a prostitute to support you and your son? After all, that's all you're qualified for. This is a consent form, Robin. It is. Is it yours? No. Robin Turner believes a misspelt signature on the record she obtained years later is not hers. This is for Robin Leslie Turner. And yes, I am Robin Leslie Turner. But this Robin has a Y in her Robin and a Y in her Leslie. Whereas I am R-O-B-I-N-L-E-S-L-I-E -E, Turner. But if we come down to the signature, it's been signed R-O-B-Y-N. So it wouldn't matter how many drugs or whatever else they gave me, I'm not going to misspell my own name. The day after she was discharged, Robin was permitted to visit the hospital where her son was being treated and briefly hold him. A few weeks later, she says she received a telephone call informing her her son was dead. 43 years later, she got another call her son was on the line. I waited 21 years and every year I knitted him a jumper. 
from the age of one to 21. And I kept them all. So when he eventually turned up, if he was alive, he would know that I loved him and I cared for him. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. And um, when he didn't turn up, then I knew what they told me was true and I'd killed him. I'd killed him because I wouldn't sign that bloody piece of paper that they could operate on him. Sorry. So I spent 43 years thinking I murdered my own child. I have no doubt that some illegal activity occurred. I've no doubt, no doubt that women were subject to what nowadays, as I said, we would call abuse, that forged consents occurred and that forced consents occurred. And then you've got your whole area that, that you wouldn't say is illegal, but you would say coercive practices were put in place. I have no doubt that all of that occurred. Um, for the Hansard record, could you please give... So Green you Senator you Rachel Seward is leading a Senate committee inquiry into forced adoptions. I lost my daughter to adoption in 1965. For much of the past 12 months, she has been hearing first-hand accounts from relinquishing mothers across Australia. We've had accounts of, all sorts of accounts of women being in drug states when they've been asked to sign consent forms. Now, as far as I'm concerned, that's a forced adoption. Medical records from Crown Street and other hospitals show consistency in the drugs administered to unmarried mothers. Immediately after giving birth and days before consent to adoption was given, they were routinely administered anti-lactation drugs to dry up their milk. The antenatal people marked this baby out to be taken. They indicated to the labour ward staff, the doctors, the the hospital people who were going to deal with the baby, that they were to go into this mode of uh, stopping the lady's milk, of taking the baby from her. Um, and if that one lot communicates with the other lot, I don't know of another word other than conspiracy in the English language. People not ever being able to get back to their own lives. Psychiatrist Jeff Rickaby has treated scores of relinquishing mothers and gave evidence to a New South Wales parliamentary inquiry into past adoption practices. There was often a mixture of, of drugs in the ones I, the uh, files I've seen, and I've searched through, um, you know, a great number of files. Medical records show that in the days between birth and consent, women were regularly given doses of sedatives, sometimes as much as 400 milligrams in one day. Dr Jules Black was an obstetrician at Crown Street for four years in the mid-1960s. He says barbiturate sedatives and anti-lactation drugs were routinely prescribed to mothers, married or not. Well, having looked at some of the case files, I can say categorically that the doses there of the two or three various drugs are absolutely within normal limit, with standard night sedation for all patients, let me say married, unmarried, male or female, you will find the same doses in that era uh, in a general hospital. So these amounts of sedatives are not excessive? No. I was conducting obstetrics in bush nursing hospitals uh, at the time and A, I would never have given uh, heavy barbiturates to any, anybody full stop at any time in those days. Um, B, the drugs they used were excessive. Um, they would use Valium, Amatel, Pentobarbitone on the same day. They would use chloral hydrate. And anybody signing a consent if they'd had one of these in the 48 hours previously would be, in my view, quite inappropriate to take consent. You, in, a consent's meant to be informed, you know. Did they understand all their possibilities? No. Conspiracy is a rather uh, strong word. That makes it sound as though everybody got their heads together and thought, you know, <laughs> and it wasn't like that. But in effect? But it was a very entrenched societal attitude. There's no doubt about that. So that pressure and combined with the sedation, didn't that amount to duress? Well, in that sense, yes, it was duress. 
It was. I think they were under enormous pressure. I would use the word pressure, perhaps, rather than duress, I suppose, because duress has legal connotations. Essentially, my job was to shut them up, stop them crying, get them to realise that giving up their baby was the best thing that they could do and get on with it. How do you feel about that now? Awful. Jan was a trainee social worker at Sydney's Royal Hospital for Women in 1972, when it was run by the Benevolent Society. She does not wish to be identified, but deeply regrets the part she played in pressuring unmarried mums. What would you say to them if they expressed an interest in keeping the child? Uh, they're uh, good couples with good education, good home, good everything, who really want to have a child. And you're being selfish to deny your child the opportunity of a good life in a good home, a much better life than you could provide. Was it absolutely clear to you, as a young trainee social worker, that that was the only message to be delivered? Yes. That was the only message that um, I was supposed to deliver. If I attempted to tell the girls anything else, I got called into the School of Social Work and reprimanded. This hospital acts as one of Victoria's many adoption agencies. Last year, it arranged 355 adoptions. In 1970, Four Corners went inside one of the nation's other booming adoption centres, Melbourne's Royal Women's Hospital. It found a team of social workers busily counselling single mums-to-be. How do you think you're going to feel having given a baby up for adoption? Oh, it's going to be hard, naturally, but I'll try and try my best. Mm. You think you're going to regret it later? Oh, I hope not, anyhow. Mm. Something I just had to find out. Doubts tormented some mothers, but others appeared clearly informed and aware of their right to revoke consent. Well, I'm not married, as you understand. And I thought it's more important for a child to have a home and a settled home where there is both a mother and a father and a paternal and maternal influences. Once I'd made the decision that I almost stopped thinking of the child as being mine, that I was having it for somebody else. After the adoption, I was left with a profound sense of meaninglessness. Others' experiences of the Royal Women's Hospital were far more confronting. Faye Nyson and Patsy Gall both surrendered their children here when they were teenagers in the 1960s. I wasn't um, informed about any other option really except adoption. Only selfish mothers keep their babies. I was told that. And I will. If I really loved her, I would do what's best for her. And that was the thought of the day, I suppose. And if, um, and how would I provide for her? Well, maybe I would have thought of a way in time, but that option wasn't really given to me. So I do feel it was coerced. I thought any decision would be made after the birth. It was totally unexpected that I wasn't allowed access to my son. Patsy Gore was only 15 years old in 1966 when she gave birth at Melbourne's Royal Women's. Now, for the six days I was in there, I was begging to hold my son, pleading with the nurses and with the social worker. She was in plain clothes. And she just said no emphatically that I couldn't hold him. It was like a machine. No one told me when I get into hospital I wouldn't be able to hold him. No one said that. In 1969, Faye Nyson did get to see her daughter. But her experience might be the exception which proved the rule at the Royal Women's back then. I remember when everybody sort of afterwards, when everyone left, there were two nurses 
and one nurse handed me my baby and the other one said, oh, you're not supposed to do that. And the other one, the first one said, I don't care. So I did get to see her and she was, you know, just this beautiful little doll, really. She was lovely. It was a kind of like a production line. And when you're running a production line, this is a really cruel way to describe it, but if you're running a production line, you run it for maximum efficiency. And maximum efficiency for the hospital was getting that signature because then the next steps could be taken. Shirley Swain is currently completing a four-year national study on past adoption practices. She also produced an independent report which led to the Royal Women's Hospital making a public apology last month. The Royal Women's Hospital apologises to every woman who felt she had no choice but to relinquish her child for adoption whilst in our care. We understand many, ex many relinquishing mothers experienced and continue to experience feelings of grief, pain, anger, helplessness and loss and for this we apologise unreservedly. And through all of that we found no evidence of uh, illegal practice or of women who did not give consent. The hospital also claims there were no hospital-wide policies that discriminated specifically against single mothers. However, this memo from the medical superintendent at the Royal Women's in 1960 shows that it was hospital policy to treat single mothers differently. In it, he says, babies of patients marked A for almoner or social worker will not go out to the mother until the almoner is contacted regarding the baby's future, unless the mother specifically requests to see and care for the baby. What it is indicating is that all single mothers were considered to be almoner cases. And so the almoner was to come in there. And we know what happened when the almoner went there. She had a really strong adoption message. If you ask to see your child, in the end they would let you. But they're making this poor dependent woman who's greatly distressed have to suddenly exercise herself on a personal rights campaign, which wasn't the way hospitals operated then. I remember, I remember giving birth, I remember hearing him cry and, and then they just took him straight out. When Margaret Freeman took on Newcastle Martyr Hospital aged just 16, it was 1975. Single mothers had been getting government benefits for two years and Australia's adoption rate was in freefall. Margaret still could not resist the pressure to give up her child. What do you remember about coming here? Just what I lost. Yeah. Uh, I asked in the, in the days afterwards to see him and they kept telling me that it'd be best not to see him. It'd make it harder for me to adopt him out. And it was before I had signed anything. And they didn't let me see him until after I'd signed the papers. And, and then it was only like a couple of minutes through a glass window the day that I was leaving hospital. But days later, Margaret changed her mind. Supported by her mother, she returned to the hospital to revoke consent. I told Mum I wanted to keep him and she said, well, we'll go back and get him. And she said, you got 30 days to, to change your mind. So we went back to see Sister Martin to revoke the consent. And she said that if we were too late, that he'd already been adopted out to a, a family. Five years later, Margaret received a letter which showed she had not been told the truth. Medical records later confirmed that her son remained at the Martyr a full month after she'd tried to retrieve him. The realisation that the nun had lied to me so much, um, I went back to the hospital and saw her um, and just, just gave her a piece of my mind. I just need to let it out. Um, and just told her she was a liar and a thief and that I hope she burns in hell for what she did to us. 
what she did to me, what she did to my son. To those present today and to those across Australia who carry broken hearts as a result of the role that some Catholic organisations played in this widespread common public policy practice of years past, I say sorry. Catholic Health Australia has apologised to relinquishing mothers who feel they were mistreated in hospitals like the Newcastle Martyr. The organisation is also calling for a national apology from federal and state governments. But it shouldn't just stop with the words of an apology. There must follow an appropriate system of better access to records, of properly funded and tailored counselling services, and also a national grievance process so that those that continue to have specific concerns about their own experience can have some resolution brought in their own case. Despite the apology, Margaret Freeman is considering legal action against Catholic Health. Apology won't, won't do anything to make things right. They need to uh, be held accountable for what they did. They need to come, come forth and be honest with what they did. They knew what they were doing to us. Mothers are divided over whether apologies help or help whitewash allegedly illegal acts. The West Australian Government led the way with an apology in 2010. I now apologise to the mothers, their children and families who were adversely affected by these past adoption practices and express my sympathy to those individuals whose interests were not best served by the policy of those times. Every single inquiry we've had, uh, at some stage during the inquiry, it, everybody would have a tears in their eyes um, so because, of, because the accounts we were hearing were so emotional. But in Western Australia, there was a, a different energy in the room. Certainly, that's what I took from it, because people were feeling that while the apology didn't resolve everything, it was a start, and that pe there was an acknowledgement of, of the pain and suffering and grief caused by these past practices. I suppose there are two sorts of apologies. You apologise for something that you've done that was wrong. The other one is when you say you are sorry for something that has happened to somebody. And I think anybody who was in that business, like me, <laughs> for example, I would be very happy to say that I'm extremely sorry for the, the pain and trauma and the things that happened to women in those days. And, but I don't think I was doing those things. Patsy Gall eventually married and had daughters of her own. But she says her experience at Melbourne's Royal Women's Hospital was so painful that she repressed the details of her son's adoption for 30 years. Um, I was always wondering what was wrong with me. I was traumatised most of my life and didn't know it. I had no insight into what drove me. And I didn't become conscious of the adoptions until the late 90s when I heard another mother's story. I identified with it. She wasn't allowed to hold her baby after the birth. And I was, guess I was psychologically ready to face it then. Even before Patsy filled in the blanks of her first birth, her lost baby came back into her life a grown man. Well, I dropped the phone. I slumped to the kitchen floor. My daughter had to help me into the bedroom. I was so shocked. And then he wrote me a letter saying, look, let's see each other soon. I know you want to see me. So I drove down to Geelong. And when we embraced, it was instant intimacy. I've never experienced anything like it. And that held us in good stead to have a relationship, an ongoing, enduring relationship.
How you go, huh? Oh. <laughs> How'd you go? See ya. Yeah. Oh. And how important is that is the relationship now for you? Yeah, it's important to me. Um, I'm pretty close to my sisters now. I see them quite often. And we speak on the phone weekly. Because um, they've got children now too. Um, and I keep in touch with Patsy and call in there when I'm going past because I go up to Melbourne regularly for work. Um, and we've just stayed very good friends. All such reunions are defined by intense and often conflicting emotions. Some go well, many do not. None are easy. I think if, if you left the reunion for four or five years and just had contact by my letters, you might build up a relationship. But I had a reunion with my son about a month after the initial contact and I had just started to experience 30 years of grief and it was just too much. Whatever the Senate inquiry recommends, one fact is indisputable. Many Australian women were asked to give up their babies and get on with their lives. They did what society asked of them, moved on, married and raised families of their own. But they could never forget the ones they've loved but never known. It wasn't a perfect family life, no. No, because... Um there was only half of me there. The other half was hidden. The real me was hidden. Hidden back when I first went to Crown Street as a young pregnant woman. That was the real me. The me that fell pregnant. And that me has never resurfaced, ever. I've always been damaged. Permanently damaged. How do you think you can build a life when uh, your first child has been stolen from you. How can you build a life? You can't gloss over it. He's always there. He's in the background of your mind. He's in your heart. So as a person, you're really just half in the present. You're half worried about what happened to him. Is he functioning well? Is he happy? Um, and when you don't get any of those questions answered, that's when it starts to take its toll on you. So, not possible to move on, not possible. We've been carrying the blame wrongfully for all these years, 37 years for me. Yeah, I've lost contact with a lot of family through the shame. Um, People think that you're a bad person because you go over and chop your baby away. No, they need to know that we didn't give our babies away. We weren't given our babies in the first place. Can't give away something you didn't get. Of course, the number of people touched by the era of forced adoptions goes well beyond the single mothers and their children. There are also the adoptive parents and siblings on both sides, an incredible chapter in Australian social history. Next week on Four Corners, an anatomy of a police shooting that raises serious questions about police investigating police. Until then, good night. <laughs>